Hi guys and welcome back to another episode of Candid, where we have real talks with real people. I'm your host Shanae and today I am here with Selena. Hey. Hi. So there's been a lot going on guys and yeah. So last week we talked about immigration and Lincoln Bain and his followers, well people who supported his cause I should say, I don't want to say followers because they probably were there to support his cause. Um, they had a protest and apparently the, he was arrested and they were escorted and said that they were illegally gathered over whatever that means. And he fell and I think it was, I can't remember who the other minister was. They had comments, we talked about those comments, we talked about immigration and the, the rhetoric that the coalition of independence leader and deputy leader used. So that's just a brief synopsis what we talked about last and we also talked about price control because the government you know inflation and all is very crazy and the government had decided that they were going to implement um price control will add 38 categories of items to the price control list and, and that affected 5,000 items and basically they sat down with pharmaceutical companies in the country well retailers and grocery retailers and they explained to this explained what they wanted to do and of course, the pharmacies and the, and the grocery stores owners, they expressed that they wouldn't be able to keep their head above water if they were to do these things. Now, I don't know how true that is because we didn't see any numbers, which and I wish we did because it's kind of hard to pick a side when you don't have all the specifics. It's kind of just he say, she say. But yeah, they said it wasn't feasible for them. And they wanted a different agreement. And the government was like, you know what? Um, so I'm uh, this still happening. But let me know what you if you come up with any new ideas and we look at it. So I think it was the Bahamas Pharmaceutical Association. They said that they sent their recommendations, but they received no answer. And it was like a week or something, I think, maybe a week, almost a week, passed no answer. And November first came and I don't know if you guys saw, but I'm pretty sure every person who's been paying attention or who used the pharmacy in this one day or two day period noticed that pharmacies, well, major pharmacies were closed. And yeah, in response to that, the government decided to bulk up their public clinics that handle the influx of possible um, patients or people that needed medication coming in. So yeah, and also what I found interesting too, grocery stores, they didn't decrease their prices on the items they were supposed to decrease their prices on. So I found that interesting and I was like, okay, how was the government going to handle this? And I was like, honestly, I didn't think that the government was going to give in. I thought they were going to let them sit for a couple of days. Somebody was giving in, but I didn't think the government was going to give in right then and there. But I figured that it would probably, the government would have to lose on that because it's either the consumer was going to lose or the business is going to lose. And if the business goes down, well, if most pharmacies close down, then all of the burden is going to fall on the government. So at the end of the day, it's kind of like, it ain't no winning in this situation. So yeah, that happened. So apparently the Pharmaceutical Association and the Retail Grocery Association said that the new price control regulations specific to the pharmacy sector are untenable and not sustainable. The association has instead recommended that government eliminate value-added tax and duty on medicines and ensure that price control officers ensure that savings are passed along to the customers. That was their recommendation. Yeah, so so two days after that whole statement came out, they finally came to a resolution. I can't remember exactly what the resolution is, but yeah, so pharmacies open. Bahamians ain't got, well, residents they don't have to pay a arm and a leg for certain things anymore. I'm guessing that the government subsidized in some way whether they be cutting taxes. I don't remember. I, they, they didn't specify exactly how they were going to, 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 to cut costs. So The only thing I would say is that I was very surprised when um, I heard the talk about the price control or whatever the case may be, and it's not anything new. The government has been trying, especially coming from the family island, like almost every three months, okay. price control will call to come down because the prices are outrageous. Persons are literally living off knowing, I guess taking advantage of the situation that they're in, knowing that they're in a position where persons really need these things. And so they have no choice but to pay an arm and a leg to get these things. And it, it's pretty sad because 
I understand businesses run a profit, but that much of a profit, especially in a country where I was listening, I can't remember what the talk show was today, who I was listening to on the way home, but they were saying that Bahamas love to look down upon Haiti, whatever the case may be, but our economic status when it comes to um, my own economic status is just the same as Haiti. You literally do not have a middle class. You just have the extremely poor and the extreme wealthy. And he said that in a sad case, now I don't know if this number is accurate, but I do know that a lot of Bahamians are in the state where they don't even have $300 within their bank account. Our middle class is like literally almost depleted. He said that 10% has wealth or whatever, over 300. And then we just have those who are under 300 literally living paycheck to paycheck. So it's very sad that these services where these things are really needed have a problem. Now, I'm not saying, like you said, negotiations. I, I don't think that, what am I trying to say? A profit is needed, not a purpose to continue. But I appreciate the initiative that the government is taking to ensure that these con- these businesses are not going overboard with it. And I don't think there's nothing wrong with it, but like, I'm glad that they were able to come together and sit and negotiate. I'm just hoping that at the end of the day, we'd be human enough to consider those among us. Yeah, I definitely agree with what you were saying. And I wanted to piggyback off of what you were saying regarding what you heard on the talk show and saying that, you know, a lot of Bahamians don't even have $300 in their bank account or they live in paycheck to paycheck. And I feel like in this country, a lot of politicians like to act as though so much people live about the poverty line, but would they really, they, they create this poverty line, right? And basically, if you fall under the rate, you're considered poor. If you're above it, you're considered middle class or surviving, whatever they want to call it, right? But I feel like in this country, our poverty line is not realistic because if I can barely afford to put a roof over my head, right? and feed myself, then I'm not gonna consider myself middle class. And that's where I feel a lot of, it, it's interesting to see because a lot of these people make their, their network, pay attention to the next time election come around when they have to when they have to disclose how much they're worth. Pay attention to how many politicians are millionaires. Pay attention to it. And they are sitting here I can't remember who it was specifically. I think I saw this last, maybe like a couple of years ago, where they were talking of a, a particular politician. I can't remember who it was, or someone related to politics in some way. And they're basically saying like, like basically saying like, uh, we don't as much people. They were trying to dispute the fact that there are a lot of poor people in in the country, right? Because they're saying, oh, if you don't fall under this specific number, you're not considered poor. But I, in my head, I'm like, but if I barely making it, then. I would consider myself poor or barely scraping by. I consider middle class somebody who can live comfortably. They're not extremely rich. They're not the 1%, but they have a nice home. They have a nice car. They could afford to certain luxuries in life. Not every luxury, but certain luxuries that they enjoy. And we fail to realize that a lot of Bahamians, a lot of people living in this country are living paycheck to paycheck or just to afford somewhere to live. They have to to split the rent with somebody else or to split bills with somebody else and that shouldn't be the case and I'm glad that the prime minister said of himself but the minimum wage even the new minimum wage is not a livable wage and we understand that it's not a livable wage so why are we pretending as though as though um, um the poverty line is accurate so I, I find that's just something I wanted to touch on other found it was a bit off topic but so I feel like we have to stop we have to, we have to be empathetic with other people even business owners because me personally, if if I'm a business owner and I'm making, I'm not going to hire somebody until I'm making enough money where I can pay them a decent salary, a livable wage. I'm not going to hire somebody and pay them $250 or $250. I just can't do it. That's just me. It ain't, I, I, I don't see it. Because if I'm struggling living or if I've been in that situation, why would I put somebody else in that situation? Oh, minimum wage jobs are unskilled jobs. That's incorrect. You have to have some sort of skill, whether it's communication, whether it's uh, it's adding and dropping math. Like you have to use some skill for this job. You just don't go sit there and be be blank and sit there all day and do nothing. You the, like come on. So I don't like that term unskilled labor per se. So yeah, it's just 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 my thought. Like just just be empathetic to people and understand what they're going through and why these things are important why an increase in wages is important why a decrease in taxes is important to some 
of course the country still needs taxes to run but if people are if a lot of people are living in poverty now it's not it doesn't make sense to continue to tax people who are suffering in my humble opinion so like this is stuff to be able to look at you know and a lot of people were talking about it from an economic standpoint saying oh <clears throat> the raise of minimum wage is going to result in in job loss and blah, 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 which is based on economics. I, I don't know much about economics, but I feel as though the reason people are going to lose jobs is because businesses are going to cut back because they now have to pay their employees more and they want to stay within that budget. That's just my humble opinion. So if you ask me, and I'm not talking about small businesses or businesses that are just getting out of there. I'm talking about like big corporations as well because they want to they spend less money. And that's just what it is. So I feel like it's kind of unfair to use that to say, oh, don't you don't raise wage because people are going to lose jobs. Mm, like, I understand. But at the same time, it's just like, that's so weird. Like, so we're going to stay making $210 minimum for the next 20, 30 years because you don't want people to lose jobs. At the end of the day, people are going to lose jobs regardless. That's just the way the cookie crumbles, I guess. But moving on, I don't know if you guys remember. I think this was October last year, 2021, Michael the Archangel attempted to remove the statue of Christopher Columbus in front of government house. Like this man was literally, he was going out, like he was trying to break this the statue down, right? So recently, I think this was sometime earlier this week, maybe, the communications director, Latre Raman, said that the statue has been placed in storage and at the Ministry of Works until it is determined what it will be used for in the future. And since that incident, and after the re- I think it was the renaming of the holiday, National Heroes Day as well, because you know we had something called Christopher Columbus Day. Um, there have been a lot of calls for anti for an anti-colonial movement aimed at the liberation of cultural identity and behemoth icon and the removal of colonial representations in Bahamian society, including the nation's currency and statues in historically significant locations. So I don't know if you guys know Dr. Curry. He used to be a professor at the University of the Palmas. And he said that what that gentleman did, Michael the Archangel, he did what a lot of people couldn't voice or express. And he said it was a catalyst for a much wider conversation about complacency to enact legislation that would allow for monuments and reminders of the Bahamas colonial past to be transferred to a dedicated location such as a museum and the lack of Bahamian figures in strategic locations and the absence of a national, national heroes park. So my thoughts on this is, I think it should have been taken down a long time ago because Christopher Columbus ain't no saint. We like to, to spread a lot of false information saying that, oh, he discovered the Bahamas, how when he met people here, he killed, he raped, created mass, like literally mass genocide. He was not a good person, like based on what the actual history and the actions that, that he displayed, he was not a good person. So why are we celebrating this man? Why are we saying that, oh, the Bahamas was discovered by this man? Like, okay, yeah, he had great um, sea boy just because he learned that you could travel from, I think East West. He figured that out and all. But I mean, like, he didn't discover anything. He discovered it for their side of the world, but people were already here. So why are we celebrating it? If anything, we should be celebrating the Lucayans, the original people. Like, I make it make sense. And like a lot of people during that time were arguing that, oh, it's a part of history, blah, 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 blah. I under- we understand that it's a part of history, but we're not saying that to delete that part of history. And we're saying to put it somewhere else because it doesn't deserve to be in front of government house. So, okay, where do I even begin? So, when we think about it now, the reason why it's be in front of government house is because remember that's where the government govern governor general lives, and remember the governor general is the representative of the queen, the, well, queen. the king now. King Lord, I ain't even ready for that. Anyway, moving on. So. Now, if I remember history correctly, Christopher Columbus wasn't sent by Britain. He was from Spain or whatever the case may be. But however, to me, both of them, the government house, gov- government house and the statue represented colonial reign to me. And so, like um, you said, Mr. Curry said, he did with a lot of famous couldn't voice. And the fact that you had, you had the questions over and over again, well, if we're an independent country, why do we still have a monarch as our head of state still on books 
And why is it that we still have a lot of practices that, you know, basically we're in neo-colonialized. Um, and so I, it's an interesting twist because we're not really independent on books, yes, but technically we're not. But the conversation arise where, okay, if we were to become a republic, where would that leave us? And that's a very serious thing because when you think of the ramifications of removing yourself from the from the ties that you have with a not colonial power, but you know, one of the first world countries, as a, as a country on a whole, we're not able to defend ourselves, which is one of the main reasons why, you know, um, a lot of persons would state, well, I don't know, they don't understand why there is so much detest towards the colonial past and um, present because we can't defend ourselves. Defense Force Army, the Defense Force um, and Police Force, if anybody decides to declare war on us, we <laughs> we might as well drop the white, white flags one time because we, we have no, if we remove ourselves from the Commonwealth completely and try to go on our own, we, 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 uh, we cannot possibly stand on our own, especially in the face of war. And so that's a, another reason why I kind of pulled back from my uh, end colonial reign or whatever the case may be, because we have to be very realistic of it. But however, getting back to the topic, when it comes, when it came to the statue, I remember, I will not say who, but um, one of the persons very close to me were telling, was telling me that um, we as Black people are very ignorant because that's our history and why is it a problem for there to be a statue of him? And I was, sta I was stating that, and like, I was so glad that you said it, said it. It's not us trying to erase our history, but you have to remember that was carved and a statue is for monumental purposes. And like you say, there's nothing that needs to be remembered or glorified or celebrated when it comes to Christopher Columbus. He was not the first to discover our country. He was not the first person to land here. History literally falsely tells the story of him. And um, the first step was removing the holiday. And I think another step would be to remove the statue. Now, to say to completely do away with it, I would think it would be best to put it in one of the um, museums that we have. Like for instance, we have Pompeii House and we have like, our, um, I think it was Pompeii House that, um, that um, had the display of slavery um, artifacts and stuff like that in the Bahamas. I'm not saying to erase, I'm, I personally, I'm not saying to erase these parts of history. I'm just saying that a statue should not be um, erected in honor of him or should be, um, um, should be allowed to stay up, stay up. I believe that it should be stored somewhere within the museum, but not in the capacity of which it was. And so I am honestly glad that he did it because it kind of sparked that revolution and What's crazy is that he will go down in history. A lot of persons look at him as a crazy person, but he will go down in history and doing something that a lot of us did not have guts to do. And so that's my five cents on that. Yeah, like you said, it's not it's not erasing the history because, like you said, Michael Lamarck, the archangel, he's going to be written down in history as the man who tried to destroy Christopher Columbus. So I feel as though that'll be a very interesting story to tell if it was in one of the museums you know what I'm saying and a lot of him it's it's interesting to me that that like you said that, that close said that we are ignorant to our history I I disagree well I agree to an extent but she is just she's saying that for the wrong reasons what we're taught in school is not Bahamian history what we're taught in high school is not Bahamian history you have to go you have to seek for yourself and then like a lot of information. When I went to, to University of the Bahamas, I took about four or five history classes. Two, I think, were built into my curriculum, um, but that was more about media because I studied journalism. But I chose to study Haitian, Haitian migration. Um, I still to study um, history of the Bahamas one and two. And I think it was another one as well. And I learned so much in those classes that I never, I've never even fathomed. I've read good chunks of, of books created by Bahamians, Bahamian historians who have written, who've, who've, like, I don't understand. Like, I'm sorry, like, I'm just lost for words. The fact that we have so much resources, we have quite a few people here who are very knowledgeable, such as Gail Sands, Dr. Christopher Curry, these people who have, who have, who've done extensive research into Bahamian history, yet this history isn't being taught in school. Yet on our BGCSEs, we're still talking about American history. The only, ever, the only thing we ever talk about that's related to Bahamian history is the Lucayans. And then we talk about slavery in the Bahamas. Please correct me if I'm wrong. And I feel like that's an issue. That's a problem. And a lot of Bahamians 
they were being taught, they then glory, glorify colonialism and they, they think that Christopher Columbus is this hero and a lot of other misconceptions that are wrong and until, and they don't know any better. And most people aren't gonna, you know, go just read random books about Bahamian history. It's not, it's not gonna happen. Let's be honest, the average, average person isn't gonna do that. But I feel like we should start teaching the truth. So like you said, the first step was renaming the holiday. I feel like the second step was moving the statue. And I think the third step should be moving towards fixing our curriculum surrounding history so that children are being taught the truth and not a whitewashed or colonialized version of what we believe is history or what they believe is history. I'm so glad that you brought up the classes because to be completely honest, I'm, I'm one thing I'm really thankful for is the um, professor such as um, Professor Shanti um, Seymour, as well as Professor Curry and also Craig Smith, I believe, not Craig Smith, what's his next one? Anyway, Ian Bethel, they really opened my, my eye to a lot of um, our history that is almost, like you said, whitewash and try to try to be buried in order to keep this um what do I want to say friendly relationship between us and our um those who colonialized us and a lot of persons are believed even you know we hear about slavery in the Bahamas but a lot of persons when you when you think about slavery in the Bahamas like it's not in comparison to slavery slavery in America however that is another misconception about slavery and how it happened within the Bahamas because all those brutal things that were happening in America also happened here but persons don't even know that and so when it comes to now the discovery of the Bahamas and what happened really it's almost like it's almost done I could remember in civics learning about um slavery whatever the case would be but it's almost like slavery is not really touched on per se or talking about the different riots the different slave um persons like you know how america had the underworld railroad and persons like harriet who really stood up we had pers- we had slaves as well in the bahamas who went against and some of them were even hanged and killed for what they did but we have stories like that but it's not being told it's almost like slavery the, it's just a surface thing and then they they go straight to um, the riots and even the stories about the riots and what happened and what they had to do it's it's not done in detail and I think we do ourselves a great injustice by doing that because when I think it was a quote that says when a per- when people don't know their past they don't they won't be able to um, really touch in their potential and their future and as a country as a whole if we don't know where we've come from then how do we know where we're about to go um, I watched a video of a man I cannot remember his name but I just had to pause and listen to what he's saying he said that you know anybody who who's who's around a kid knows that the most the most popular thing right now is TikTok and learning the TikTok dances I mean you would see three-year-olds four-year-olds shaking their sides you know learning these dances like nothing singing these songs doing these challenges and he said that do you know we know that TikTok was created in China and he said that the algorithm the algorithm for TikTok is different in China than it is in America and the um and the, and, and other countries. He said that in order to sabotage the development of a country, you go to their use. And he said you in um most most reels within TikTok in different countries, you would see dances, you would see silly pranks, you would see all these other things that are not. I wouldn't say not bad per se, but too much of it, the intake of it, it um, when you're watching it, you feeling um, happiness or whatever. I can't remember, what is it? What is the chemical that goes on? Dopamine. And so now you equate that um, foolishness with dopamine and happiness. And so that's why you keep on doing it continuously, continuously, continuously. So while your youth, the country's youth, is now just focused solely on being able to do these dances or just, you know, brainwashed by different things that they're seeing there. Not to say that that's the only content and not that um, there are other content, but the majority of it, that's what's being pushed. The algorithm in China is persons excelling in their studies, agriculture, architecture, all these different things to not, not so much brainwash, but to reinforce what they're already learning in school and in their community. 
he said, he said that the future for, of a country is based on their youth. And how do you, the, the best weapon is not war, but you sabotage the youth of a country in order to, you know, propel your country to get a better head over them. And I was just like, wow. I mean, I'm just paraphrase, paraphrasing. But I, I thought to myself, I'm like, wow. Because literally as a teacher within the school, that's all I see. That's all they're interested. Let's have to, let's make, I don't, I don't have a TikTok for the same reason. Let's make a TikTok. Oh, let's um, come do this challenge with me. That's all you hear. Nobody's interested in their grades. Nobody's really interested in, in their studies. It's just like, we're babysitters and they get this information and it's okay. I'm just waiting till I go home so I can make this new video, learn this new challenge, be able to do this, be able to do that. And it's just, it's very sad to see what this man is saying. It's really, that's the reality we're at right now. And I just say, Lord have mercy when it comes to our country, because if this is what our youth, the generation of tomorrow, not 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 even so much tomorrow today really if that's what they're into and we already see the america building this huge embassy we got china right there i'm just like uh -huh, uh -huh, talks about becoming a republic but i don't think even if we were to remove from under britain i just believe we're just going to be the first picks for any other first first world country because we're not really pushing or not really doing what we need to do in order to prepare our youth for the generation to come to be in order to be leaders. And guess what? At the end of the day, when the old order comes out, there has to be a new order. And I wonder what the faces will look like if we're not teaching and forcing our students to take that place, to take that place. And God forbid they follow the same old order because we really would be in problems still. So that's just my five cents on it. Going back to what you said, talking about the lecturers that that helped open your mind. I remember the first class that I took my first semester was 119. This is an English class, the first level English class with Dr. Shanti Seymour. And I learned so much in that class. It was a hard class, man. And I was mad because I wasn't getting the grades I was used to. Right. But I'm very glad that I took that class because it was in her class that I learned that we speak a Creole. We don't speak because all your life you heard, you learn. Oh, I speak in Bahamian dialect. Um, this is that and the next. And I didn't even, I always thought that Creole was just Haitian Creole, like that was their language. But she explained that no, a Creole is basically when two languages merge and Ghana have like another little language with words, different words from this place and words from the next place or whatever. Because and she explained to me that we get the way we speak from our ancestors the Gullah Geechis who came from Africa, and then obviously the language of our colonizers mixed with that, and that gives us, that gives us Bohemian Creole. So that's why we have the boy and the this, the I, yes, and, and like, I really enjoyed that class for that very reason. I learned that. That's something I learned, and I always, whenever I hear somebody miss saying something, I, I like to correct them, because if you know better, if I know better, I won't do better. And I share in what I know with you. So if you choose to be to remain ignorant to what I'm telling you, and that's on you. But I feel like I've done my part as a person to try and help educate you on something. And I want to change that narrative that, oh, only Haitians speak Creole because I feel like we stigmatize the, the word in its sense, in a whole sense, be just because we attach it to to a, a, a certain demographic of people, which is also wrong. And I don't even want to get into that right now. We've been talking about that very often on the show, but you guys know what I'm trying to say. Like we, we feel offended when we, people will feel offended when I say, oh no, it's not a die, like it's a Creole. They feel offended. And that's not something that you should be offended by. It's just the truth, literally the truth. And this lady has, I think she has a master's or a bachelor's in, I don't know which one it is, maybe even the doctorate. I can't remember. She explained the credentials to us, but she has a degree in linguistics. And she extensively studied the Bahamian language and like she's well qualified, you know? Um, so I just wanted to share that piece of information with you again. I pretty sure I shared it maybe two or three weeks ago. Don't recall, but I'm sharing it again for those who may not have heard it before. Yeah. So guys, I'm gonna restart and come back. Okay, yeah. So going into another topic. Social Services wants to launch a program that will help with domestic violence cases. And early in the year, we did a whole series on domestic violence. We talked about domestic violence against women, um, violence against children. 
as well and how to identify signs, how to help stop this if you can and how to get away and you could who you could contact. So the Bahamas Crisis Center was one of the places that you could contact and their number is 328-0922. And they help men, women, and children in abusive situations. So if you do know someone that is enduring domestic violence or if you are going through it right now, you can contact them and they will help you as best as they can. Again, at 328-0922. So the Ministry of Social Services and Urban Development are collaborating to hopefully create a research unit that will help examine data better. And it is their hope that it will be up and running in the coming weeks. So the Minister of Social Services and Urban Development, the Honorable Obadiah Wilshkrum, said that one of the difficulties we met when I became minister is a lack of data. This has been an issue, but we are now creating in the but we are but we are now creating in the ministry as well a research unit that's responsible for the collection of data because without data, it's very difficult to contend with the issues. He also said that there are some 60 active domestic violence cases that are being investigated. However, he said that they, even though they get statistics, it takes time to organize and to store. And he said that these, this is a joint effort between the Royal Bahamas Police Force and the Bahamas Crisis Center. But he said the biggest problem is manpower. And it's kind of difficult to put all of that on the police because you know they're dealing with a lot. So the whole point of this research unit is to help gather data so that they can help assess the problem and try to get to the root of the problem and hopefully help solve it. He also said that there are about 15 cases, 1,500, sorry, cases of violence against children. Now, that is crazy. That are pending. So this, uh, this unit will also be a legal unit. Sir, and they will be bringing, assisting the police in the work that it has to do. And they will be bringing in lawyers and some investigators to ensure that we are more active. So basically, like you heard, the hope of this unit is to help solve delay problems and to get cases out sooner and to get the information needed to address these issues. So I think this is a very good idea. I think it is about time that this happened, especially after the year that we've had with the amount of women that have died as a result of being in dom dom um, domestically abusive relationships. And I, I think this research unit would help get down to the bottom if it if it's successful and if it's run how they hope it will be run it will help understand these cases better it will help us understand the mental capacity of these individuals maybe um um they i don't know have some some type of trauma that they're dealing with like extreme trauma because i know hurt people hurt people and i don't know but it, it would give us a better understanding because like the honorable obadiah wilshkrum said it's it's hard to gauge what's going on when you don't when you don't have the data. Well, you have the data, but you don't have an understanding of the data, and so you just have all this this raw data, and you don't know how to comprehend it. So as a result, you don't know how to fix the problem. So I feel like this is a great idea, and I hope that it works. It should, and I pray, I pray, like I really pray that that it helps because I'm so sick and tired of of seeing seeing this and it isn't even just just women it's it's men it's children as well children are abused as well and it, it's a lot on just like you say just the police force we, we've even talked about how the police force handle these situations and in some cases it wasn't the best way to handle these things but I don't know I guess all of this would get down to the bottom of that and maybe understand why victims don't trust the police while they choose to deal with it by themselves or whatever the circumstances may be so yeah I agree with everything you said yeah but I think this is, I just think it's a really good a really good initiative and it's good to see that that this government is coming in and they're they're acting on the things that they said they will do so far and I'm happy that that is one of the things that will be tackled and like I said, I just hope that it works. Like it works the way they want it to work. Because, you know, sometimes we we underestimate how difficult some things may be. But I just hope they get there. So the last thing I wanted to talk about, well, I lie. It wasn't the last thing. The next thing, I lie, because I saw this post right before I started this, right before we started recording. So I don't know if you know. So it's called SERS, and it stands S-E-R-Z. It stands for Special Economic Recovery Zone. So after 
Hurricane Dorian that ravaged the Bahamas. I think that was in 2019 or 2020. Can't remember. It's been about two years now, so 2020. And the government, as a result, had a service order in place, which basically allowed people to rebuild, um, to get, I think, grants from the government or was a part of it, and to bring in things, to be free, bring in vehicles, bring in building supplies at a reduced cost, so they can get their lives back on track. So two years after the, the aftermath of the Korean, the government announced that they will not be extending the program, and that they didn't say that they won't help. They said that they won't extend the program because it will leave too many holes and people would begin to take advantage of it is what they but is what their stance was. However, they said that they would go by a case by case basis and anyone um, who needed help and they looked at the case and they meet all the criteria, they would help them in whatever way they, they knew how. So they're, they're not stopping anything completely. It's just that it's not going to be open to everyone. It's not going to be free reign. You know, you, you have to apply for these things for whatever reason, right? And I think yesterday I saw, or this morning I saw, today sometime. Yeah, so Grand Bahama is asking for an extension of the service order so that they can continue to rebuild. And I don't know how I feel about this. I feel like I get where the government is coming from. But then on the, under, on the other hand, I understand that people are people are struggling. And two years after a category five hurricane is crazy. Like that hurricane literally decimated the entire island. And I do not think that two years is long enough to, to rebuild. So I could understand why. Grand Bahama, the, the residents of Grand Bahama are asking for an extension because, like, y'all, yo, did y'all not see the same island I saw? Like, lots of place, like, lots of, like, the land was completely flat for most, for the most part. The island was covered in water for the most part. So I don't think two years after losing my entire house, after rebuilding my life, after probably losing jobs, um, having to relocate, maybe that two, two years is not enough for people to rebuild their life. So. I think I, I think I stand with the government on this one. However, I feel as though he should have been more clear on what he meant by case by case basis. Me personally, what I would have done, I would have closed closed it off to the public so everybody doesn't have free reign. However, those that are still in the islands that are affected could apply, do an application process, and say what they needed, how, when, and where. And if it checks out, then we grant them the, the necessary um, help that they needed. So I think I don't know if that's what they have going on. It should be an efficient process that can help these people as quickly as possible. So, yeah. Yeah, so the last thing I wanted to talk about today was going to be carbon credits. So, basically, the Bahamas is exploring the option of blue carbon credits. Carbon credits are permits that allow the owner, that would be the person that are buying them from us. So, for instance, if we are selling carbon credits and the U.S. wants to buy them from us, once they buy them, they become the owner of the carbon credits they will be allowed to emit a certain amount of carbon dioxide or other greenhouse gases. So basically, industrialized countries or countries that produce a lot of waste, like um, United States, China, they would buy carbon credits from smaller islands like us that don't emit a lot of pollution in order to help fake emphasis on, fake emphasis on help balance the depletion of, of the ozone layer and, and all of that, basically. Um, but basically, it don't make sense in my opinion. Let me tell you why. And they pay us money for it, obviously. So climate change scientist Marjan Finlayson says that investing in this new industry will not solve the climate change issue. Finlayson affirmed that carbon credits are a way for governments to potentially get funding and in theory the system seems to be justified okay pause okay so basically every country emits greenhouse gases greenhouse gases are what contribute to climate change which means which will result in summers getting hotter um winters getting colder the sea levels rising as we know the bahamas is only a little bit above sea level so if climate change begins to con if it continues in the way that it's going we're going to be underwater. However, our country is so tiny, 
we don't have a lot of factories, we barely contribute to the depletion of the ozone layer, to the depletion to the to climate change, we barely contribute to that. We do, of course, because everybody has a carbon footprint, but not as big as, as industrialized countries. So because we produce so little, countries that are industrialized that produce a lot of pollution more than they should, because I, I can't remember the agreement they have, but anyway, more than they should, what they do is they buy these credits so that they could produce more um, greenhouse gases, basically. So they, for instance, US buys carbon credits from the Bahamas so that they could produce more waste legally, basically. And this is supposed to be a way to help help decrease climate change, help decrease the amount of greenhouse gases in the air. But if you think about it, it kind of doesn't make sense. It's not slowing down pollution. It's not stopping climate change. It's not slowing down the amount of, of, of greenhouse gases being produced. The fact, I thought the object was to help lessen the amount of carbon waste that a country, you know, but it doesn't make any sense. It, it yeah. pays us to, uh, what did it say? To produce so basically, less. It's basically to take, to take our car, our, I don't know, our ale <laughs> that's unpolluted so that they could pollute, basically. I guess that's the best, that's the simplest no way I could put it. Gosh rational logic like but it's, it's about money that's all it is literally that's all it is. and guess what who's going to benefit from us from it not us because we can be underwater we can stay here under the air i should i wasn't even talking about that it was just from my economic point of view it's like okay and we're going to benefit from this how because i still trying to figure what about money on but anyway that's another topic for another day yeah so this scientist she was let me finish reading what she was saying one sec. I found her comments very, very interesting because when this topic first came up, right, and I think this was something that was talked about in the national debates around election time, and then it also came up prior to that. And I was like, okay, maybe the math ain't mathing to me. I was like, okay, I understand me getting paid for this, but to me, it never made sense because I'm like, I mean, I'm, I'm I wouldn't call myself an environ, like an extreme environmentalist, but yeah, with the environment, like kind of that's the reduce what I can. I'm not going to be a child making excessive garbage for no reason. You know what I'm saying? I take pride in the way my country looks and certain things like that. Like, like so I'm not extreme. Like, I don't have a metal straw. I would like that one. I don't have a metal straw. I don't drive an electric car. You know, like, my hosts don't run on solar panels. But I try in every way I can to reduce my foot. Right? And I feel like it doesn't make sense to to allow these larger countries to to buy carbon credit. It doesn't, it just doesn't make sense to me. It's it's allowing them to not be held accountable. It's allowing them to go over their 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 their, their, their pollution limit for less for lack of a better word. Um, so um correct me if I'm wrong, but how it works is that okay, if they continue to produce with the um the amount that they want to produce right and the ozone layer layer depletes within their region isn't it also going to have an effect on everywhere else yes i believe so okay i just i just i'm really trying to sit down and think about who came up with this with this, with this idea because i'm just like uh, uh is the environment really your 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 main concern because I, i'm confused Yep, so she, so this lady, she said, okay, Philanton affirmed that carbon credits are a way for governments to potentially get funding. In theory, the system seems to be justified. However, trying to stop climate change is impossible. Instead, the idea is to slow it down. But carbon crediting does not guarantee that. Carbon credits and the carbon crediting system is a means to get funding that can possibly help with more efforts in terms of adaptation and supposed mitigation efforts. The whole idea of carbon crediting is a theoretical idea of balancing emissions. The problem with this solution, you know, the issue isn't, it doesn't take into account that with the voluntary market itself, this is not a regulation as it should be enforced. So that's also an issue. And she said, if everyone stopped burning fossil fuels today, 
there would still be enough carbon and other hazardous gases in the atmosphere to continue global warming and other effects of climate change. So the idea rather is to stop adding high amounts of carbon emissions into the atmosphere to slow down the climate change, something that we have no control over stopping, according to Finlinson. She said, however, she's not convinced that big companies giving, more con giving countries more money and then emitting more carbon into the atmosphere will help to reduce the impacts of climate change. And I feel like anybody who wants to understand can understand what this, this lady is saying. And I agree with her wholeheartedly because the whole point is to try, I wouldn't, well, she said it can be stopped, but the whole goal is to reduce carbon emissions, to reduce the amount of pollution in the air. But instead, you was like, you know what? I'm not going to slow down my pollution. What I'm going to do is, right? This country don't create a lot of pollution. So I got to pay them some money. So I could buy a piece of their air, which is still, it's, it's still technically not our air. But anyway, yeah, so take some of their air and I could produce this square foot of car, this, this much square foot of carbon dioxide and the other gases. And yeah, so I ain't over my limit this month. Like, huh? Your goal should be trying to figure out how to produce the things that you produce without producing as much waste. Because it can be done. Plastic bottles are being made out of algae. There have been zero waste soaps created, metal straws, nor um, biodegradable plastic bags. All of these things that have become popular over the last five to 10 years, if all of that, five to 10 years, why are we just realizing, why are we just making these mainstream now? Because climate change is getting, climate change is getting out of hand now. So now we want to try and mitigate it, but we had years and years and years and years to, to, to use this stuff, but we didn't. So I didn't even know you could make biodegradable plastic bags until we get that plastic bag. I didn't even know what was a thing. I mean, besides the cloth bag, obviously, but I mean like, but why, if, if these things were here from the jump, why wasn't that always the standard? Why were we intentionally polluting the earth? Why were we intentionally throwing millions and millions and millions of pounds of plastic into the ocean, killing wildlife? Like, how, like make it make sense. I, maybe I just overthinking it, or maybe I ain't thinking about it right, or maybe I explained it wrong, or understand it wrong, but I only could explain from, I only could explain to y'all the way I understood it and give a different perspective. But from where I stand in, it don't, it ain't, the math ain't math in the Excuse me. I just urge everyone to try your best to reduce your footprint as best as you can. Um, you know, I know everybody can't afford an electric car because electric cars are a bit more expensive. Try your best to, to, to maybe invest in metal straws, make small changes, maybe stop buying plus um, toothpaste in the tube. They have little like toothpaste tablets you could order and you like chew them and they turn into toothpaste, which is so cool. I actually want to order some of those. Instead of buying a plastic toothbrush, you can get a wooden toothbrush. Instead of buying soap shampoo in a jar, you know, not a jar, in a plastic bottle, you could buy shampoo bars. Like, it's so much different alternatives that I've been learning about, especially over the last couple of, of, of months. I just I just urge y'all to like, to look into it. Yeah, that's my two cents. That's my advice to y'all. That's my little, you know, my little takeaway from this episode but i really enjoyed having a conversation with saluna dudley ditches today because he's sick he always sick i'm pretty sure in the episode before last that we were sick now he's sick again he always sick but anyway yeah so thank you guys for tuning into another episode of candid where we have real talks with real people you can follow us on facebook and instagram at candid242 where you can keep you can keep abreast on everything that we're doing when new episodes are coming out you can ask some questions you can engage with us um so yeah, um, see you next week and keep it real behind me.